Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I am super excited to bring for you an interview with a guy that I've actually personally worked with. Uh, I have so much respect for him. Awesome magician. One of the latest foolers on foolers, which is so awesome to see. It is the legend himself, Noel Cool. So how are you doing, Noel? Hey, Craig. Yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks so much for the very kind words. I'm glad you got the email and you got all the words exactly right. For how okay, okay. Is it good? Is it good? Yeah, no, that's, that works for me, but very kind of you to say. But in all seriousness, you are, you, you've been around in the magic community, especially in the UK, for as long back as I can remember, you've been in that sort of that top tier uh, brand of magicians for a very, very long time. And, you know, oh, you're thanks. always on the top of your game and, 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 yeah, I've got so much respect for you. And I know how busy you are. You're one of these magicians that stayed busy even through lockdown. So thanks for finding the time to come on the channel. I really appreciate it. All right. It. Thank you. Awesome. Now, I, I said to you just off camera, but I'm going to say it again. Um, you are the most requested person on Magic <laughs> TV. I asked all the subscribers, who do you want to see interview next? Everyone was like, no, 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 get no one. So, um, but there's going to be some people who don't know you. Um, probably not now that you've just been on Foolish, but a lot of people that watch this, over 60% of the viewing audience are in the States. So let's just start off from the very beginning and, and just find out a little bit about you. When did you get into magic? Was it when you were a kid and you got a magic set, yeah. that kind of chestnut? So it's, so, well, there was a little bit of the magic set and all that good stuff happening, but the, the real thing was I, um, I went to Ireland with my parents and there was an old guy at the uh, races uh, doing three card tricks, doing three card Monty, a genuine old guy. It sounds like the kind of thing out of a movie, it genuinely was happening. And I was with my dad and he'd seen it when he was a kid. And he told me when I started to get interested, lightly interested in magic, he said, you know, we'll go to the races and there'll be someone doing three card trick there. And he had perfect knowledge of being a kid. I stayed there. I missed all the races, just stayed there for hours and hours watching him. And watching, I didn't know exactly, I could tell, well, I knew it wasn't fair, and I knew other people that weren't directly um, uh, with the gang, but they seemed to be talking afterwards in between and things like that, so I was intrigued by that. I watched him for the whole day, and I sort of figured out the, um, uh, well, the, the hype move, I sort of figured out basically uh, something that, that, that sleight of hand was happening. I didn't know exactly, but I went back to school, I made up my own version of what he might have been doing, which wasn't right, but it was nearly right and I fleeced my mates and that really encouraged that thirst for knowledge so so, so that's probably my sort of my first sort of official start thinking this is pretty cool um and um and then after that I was absolutely crazy for it so so you were able to show your friends the three card Monty after studying it for a whole day not reading a book not being taught it you were able to kind of yeah I, I, had, I had no routine but no, no more than I, yeah I could do one slide that I sort of I, I fudged my way to do it. And this guy must have been, you know, he was an old boy. He might have been doing it for 40 years. He was, he was, you know, very, very proficient. I didn't know what he was doing, but I made up my own version. And yeah, I'd go back and I'd sort of do it for 20p a go um, at school and uh, and hustle my way through uh, occasional wet breaks. So that was, um, that was pretty exciting. That's awesome. And then uh, the bug bit. And was it books you were buying or how did you kind of feed that knowledge for more magic? So I had so, so the bug bit, but I think the truth is um, uh, that I had, so I would think of two sort of times when, I, when, when magic was my primary focus. Uh, so there was the early days when we were looking at magic sets and that time when I went to Ireland. Then that carried on at about that level. I had books from, uh, I had the Tarbell course that I got from a car boot sale from a mum. I remember at the time she said, they had like seven books, but it was raining. So I got you one to see how it was, uh, see how you'd like it. Obviously now I desperately wish that all books could be picked up for 50p. Uh, it's a first edition Tarbell book, um, Tarbell course. And all the rest of them were there. Obviously, you know, years later, I realized the value that had been missed out. But um, so that was super exciting. But it just, it, it didn't drift away as much as sort of, it was, it was there in the back of my mind. Magic shows on TV, I'd watch it. I'd know some things, but it was before the internet. And that stayed that way for a few years until, uh, like a lot of us, Blaine hit and it was reignited. So it was sort of slow burn until I was, what was Blaine, 97? So yeah, I would have been 20 then. So that was when it really, really hit and, um, and straight, you know, crazy. 
and then I was yeah in internet early days of the internet I was all over that I was buying bits and pieces of sort of brass tricks I was always fascinated you know a complete mark for you know uh, what's it called uh, coin unique and uh, you know uh, all of those bits and pieces well, those nicely engineered them. things so I got I got really into all that okay and and you're about 20 years old there so you kind of um so blame reignited your interest did you when did you turn professional then because i i i've known you as a professional magician as long as i've been in magic it feels like but when when did uh, you 2001 turn? i started uh, I, I had a it was that was so yeah i was 20 years yeah 20 years this year so uh, 2001 is when i the lot well 2001 is the last year i had a real job and I was technically still looking for another job. It's close to unemployed is what I was, because I wasn't, I didn't announce I was a professional magician as much as not have another job. And I had a mate of mine, Rob James, and Rob had, uh, he was already, you know, he's about a year ahead of me. He started doing gigs and he gave me some bits and pieces. And I just thought, oh, cool. I'm doing my very first uh, early magic gigs. And I didn't think it was going anywhere. I just thought this will do till I get a job. And I probably stayed in that sort of holding pattern for two years, just doing bits and pieces, you know, just mum and dad, you know, look after me. So I didn't have to worry too much about money. And then, um, yeah, then 2003 is when I, I, I realised I wasn't pissing around. There was no other job coming and I was going to go full tilt at uh, being a professional magician. Okay. And um, so a lot of people on this channel, they ask the same question when should I turn professional? They're really interested hobbyists. They love practicing magic. And then they're kind of trying to decide whether to go professional or not. Now, let's just assume the apocalypse ends at some point. Do you have any advice for, for, for these newer sort of people that are considering whether to go full time or not? Is there anything that- Yeah, of... I mean, I think it depends. So, so for me, I think um, it's when, when you can no longer make, when, when the choice is no longer yours, where, where it is, it overcomes you where you can't think about a day passing without performing magic. And it, it is, it is everything about it because truth is it's hard now. It is even harder now to get started. I don't fancy anyone uh, getting started. You can, but you know, when I started just, I remember walking into a uh, Frankie and Benny's handing a business card to someone and they said, um, and I was trying to you know, look for work and they said, Oh wow. Cool. He's got a website. Wow. That, they were so excited. They had a website. Imagine that now of like, you know, everyone's got 10 websites and a million videos and TV credits and things like that. Just having a website was super exciting in the early days. So now you know, it's, it's a tough gig. So I, I think the answer is when, when it isn't a choice anymore, when, it, when passion becomes so much. Um, and also, if you really love magic and you fancy having a go at, at doing it for a living, the most important thing would be to have additional skills. I, I mean, I am fairly limited, but if you... Or a bit handy at Photoshop, video, marketing, any of those things. If you think you fancy going pro and your job or some aspect of your life is important, is, is, is focusing on those things, absolutely nail those things, get better and better. You look at, you know, you look at uh, successful magicians now, and you pretty much all of them have got a secondary skill that if if they absolutely had to, they could go and be a copywriter or they could be a, a sales guy for a firm or because we don't realize sort of karate kids or vibe but we don't realize that all these skills that we're getting that they're sort of you know transferable skills if we had to i don't want to but i don't doubt i could probably eke out a living doing some kind of sales job um, you know or, and and that's because i don't have those additional skills but if you do run towards them you know learn as much the internet's brilliant learn all about those things because it's you know the old adage it's show and business and the, the business side is so so important completely agree with you and I think that's why magicians fail because they quit their job to become a full-time magician and they spend all of their time doing stuff that isn't necessarily performing magic in order to get the gigs and they kind of just look at it and go this is what I wanted to do I wanted to do magic you know the days of having an agent just give you all your work doesn't really happen these Not happening, days. yeah so, so you've got it's you you've got to do all those things for yourself and you know, I, you know, I look forward to, to, to practicing a magic trick, but before I can do that in a day, I've got a lot of bullshit to do and emails reply to those and think about the website and marketing. And certainly, you know, in the last few months of uh, full loss and all those things that took up every waking second, it was absolute madness. So, you know, 
you uh, I used to sort of joke to my girlfriend about you know my fairly cushy job I didn't do much work well the truth is as she pointed out I'm always working just because I'm sat you know titting around with the iPad and things like that I'm I'm either thinking about an original magic trick or I'm thinking about the website or I'm thinking about some little change. You might not be sat at a desk, you know, typing out a couple of thousand words or something. You know, you're not, you're not digging a ditch, but you are working on your magic career. Completely agree. Uh, one thing I always say to people is try to get out of the house. I don't know what you found, Noel, but when I got, uh, when I became a professional and I was working from home, my wife would ring me up and say, can you do this chore? Can you do this chore? Can you do this chore? Because she didn't understand yeah. that I was working at home. And so she yeah. just used this as a reason to give me loads of work to do around the house. And my business was suffering. I'm like, I need to get out the house. At least then, you know, yeah. I can't be thrown into doing all of this stuff. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly bad. I am bad at, um, at focusing my attention uh, on when to work. And I think that's another great skill is wake up in the morning. And those magicians, I know you've got an office and things like that, but like those, magic those magicians who are smart enough to get an office space, it's you know tens of pounds a week. Certainly now they're desperate for it. But if you can go and do those things, where it's a place where you work and you and you go, you know, you do nine to five. It's not for me. I can't do it that way. But if you can, what a great way to do it because you know that you. Let's say you think of it as like magic is my hobby and my job. So the job part is nine to five, getting more gigs, and then after hours I can practice, I can dream, I can do silly things, I can have late nights, I can try and work on the method of something crazy, all those things. But they're not helping you get work. It's much better if you can graft in the day, do the dull stuff in the daytime and then have the uh, sort of fun ma magic sort of drifting into, a, into another sort of mental space in the evening if you can afford those, those hours. That's really great advice. In actual fact, talking about getting gigs and marketing, one thing that I said at the beginning, which I, I really believe is that in the UK, there's different sort of bands of magicians. And, and, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, but there's certain magicians that are kind of viewed as the, the top pick for top corporate events. And it always seems that you're definitely in that band of magicians. You know, you're the guy that a lot of people call on for the high end corporate shows and things like that. <clears throat> My question is, how do you develop a brand? You know, you, you've developed a brand. Noel Coulter is a brand. People want to book you above and beyond any other magicians. Even if they saw other magicians and loved them, it's you that they want. How do you create that brand around yourself so that you are, you are the person that people go to? That's an interesting question. I think, um, so, there's two, so for me, uh, the only brand that I could be is me. So, if, uh, so what a great tip, and this is, anyone can do this, uh, years and years ago, I remember showing, I was working, sounds glamorous, I was working on a movie, but it was a film that never got made, but it was still an exciting time. And I was very new to gigs and I had a, a nice business card that I was, I was super happy with, nice embossing, all the American psycho sort of craziness where I thought, oh, look at the thick card stock and I'm the man now. And I showed the publicity shots to the director that I was working with. And everyone, until that point, people who've seen it, friends and family, they all said, oh, wow, it looks great. And what they meant was, uh, this feels like thick cardstock and you're wearing a smart suit and smiling. That's great. But she's seen it. And because her whole medium was visual medium and, 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 and storytelling and understanding people and, and with you know, a sort of visual aspect, she looked at him and was like, this isn't you. This, this, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the suit and the sort of uh, like a European member of parliament sort of photograph. I just, you know, it wasn't me at all. So, I just, uh, so I had those, those early photographs, but I went so soon afterwards and got a new bunch of photographs and I uh, and tried to tell a story that was character based. So I wore, wore clothes I was more comfortable with. I wrote um, stuff on my website that was lighter in tone and humorous. You only slightly careful of those things, but just where, and I, and I thought I won't go full on for comedy magic, but I'll certainly go for quirky, which is sort of the not quite as courageous cousin but that's kind of where I pitched myself. Um, and there's, that said, there are plenty of magicians, uh, there certainly was, um, who even though it says in the books, you know, be yourself, make a, you know, there's only one you, there's plenty of work for being Mr. Generico. You know, if you can just be, if you can just be the bloke, you know, the, the guy in the suit, it's not the right answer for, in a hundred years, no one might remember you, but I certainly had phone calls saying, oh, we had this magician, 
our works do. We absolutely love. He was so, he was so funny. He was so brilliant. Anyway, we can't remember who he was, so we thought we'd book you because that's they can't remember. But that that poor sap lost out on the gig. But if they uh, there are you know plenty of magicians, you know, a guy between twenty five and forty five in a dark suit, you know, of average height, doing putting plastic blocks in people's hands. There's hundreds of those in the UK and around the world. You know, so so you can pick up a certain amount of work if you are just Mister Bloke. A good I like to think of them as sort of magical operators that they they know how the tricks work they can say the lines they've watched the videos they've learned you know the sleight of hand they can they can operate the end of these magic tricks but if you want to get to the next level uh, which is where the exciting stuff is something you need to give something of you you need to develop develop the brand so my advice would be if you know someone that you absolutely trust not family not friends maybe someone you don't speak to that often but you know has got a, a, an interesting job or they're interested they've got some I've got a good eye on a visual thing. Say, so how do you see me? How do you see me? What do you th do? You think I'm Mr. Slick? Do you think I'm Mr. Funny? Do you think I'm uh, dramatic? What's when I'm you know I'm performing a magic trick or even just chatting? How do you see me? And th what they say back to you is how other people are seeing you, and that's the most important thing for me. That's really great advice, and I, I I'll tell you a story actually of me. Uh, I, I, I don't actually know. I don't think I've ever seen your website. So if I have, I've forgotten about it. But I remember many, many years ago going to a gig and I went over to a table and a guy said, oh, um, we booked this guy for our wedding next year. I was like, who is it? And he's like, oh, it's a guy called Noel Porter. And I was like, oh, hello. Uh, you know, Noel's amazing. And he said, yeah, he had a picture of him <laughs> uh, looking over a wall. And he said, as soon as I saw that picture, I knew that was the guy that I wanted to book. Was that right? Oh, wow. Right. Is that, is that, is, did you have yeah. that picture? Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that was the, that was the photograph. I, I think somewhere deep inside the website, obviously it's been a while. And I've, so the photograph, the good thing is it was head and above. So I could probably get away with it. Whereas the bottom half was where it's got a little bit, uh, a little bit, a few more pounds. So um, I could, but it knows and above that photograph is still deep on my website somewhere. But yeah, that was the, the signature photograph that, you know, the image that I use for, 10 years I you know I used it past its sell-by date but it was so strong and so striking and it was just a fluke I went for a photo shoot and the photographer said um and he did it was a small little room and he didn't have um he didn't have a, 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 a backdrop he didn't have anything that you should have he just happened to have some white walls and a table he said just crouch behind that and that photograph it made me money it made it, it you know a career was started not just solely on that but it was so important that was branding because it said if you've seen that photograph you might be able to take a punt as to what how i might perform you know it's, you, you could go i kind of get this idea he might he must be fun he must be light-hearted and um you know he's the guy that we want yeah it, 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 it was perfect and that guy definitely definitely remembered you here's a question in in recent years and we'll talk about this in a bit but in recent years you've been doing a lot of digital magic but when you first got into into magic and, you know, you saw David Blaine and that reignited your passion. And after a few years, you went professional. How did you make your tricks unique? Because everybody that you talked about plastic blocks, you know, so many magicians do ambitious card, Omni deck, coins across, sponge balls, whatever it may be. You talked about creating a brand in your digital footprint. Mm -hmm. That's something that was extended through to the trick selection and the magic you actually performed as well, or did you do the same as everyone else? Do you know what? It's somewhere halfway, halfway um, there. I wouldn't say, certainly the material choice, um, I had a lot of crossover with um, with the standard uh, items that people would do. I'd like, I think I'd do them in my own way. But I don't think, um, I, I, if I was working on a new, new trick, something I was excited about that might get rotated in for three months um, and I'd work it up and then it it's you know three months isn't if you're doing a trick you know six months nine months you know a year year and a half later then that trick is in your set it those I had tricks that were close to, to getting in permanently and they just didn't quite make it so the rest of my material during that, those that time was uh, I'd say seven out of ten what everyone else was doing so I was doing ambitious cards and Carter wallet and all those things, but I like to think I was doing it in a way that only I could, and that it was a fun and light-hearted way that and people would remember. Oh yeah, I remember the guy in ginger hair, and he was 
it was fun and he was sarky and he, and they they kind of got me. Perfect, perfect. That's what I thought. One last question. I didn't even mean to intend to ask you about all of the business side of magic, but this is just something that's come up and it's it's actually fascinating speaking to you. One last thing I'd like to ask you about. Obviously, I see on the back of the uh, the wall there the magic circle uh, certificate. Uh, and obviously you, you do a lot with the magic circle. My question is, how important is it to network with other magicians when you're starting off as a professional? Um, because I, I know I, I regularly saw photos of you with Rob James and Andy Gladwin and all of you, you got, I was never in that circle. I mean, I never have been. I've always kind of kept myself to myself. I've networked in sort of business circles, but not mm. with other magicians, but I always saw a lot of photos of you guys working together. And is that, is that something that you would say is important? Yeah, it's, it's certainly not something that, that was set out to, to be like that. I just, I enjoyed being in their company and, and being at magic events and things like that. But for me, and so I can't remember who said it to me, but it's really striking, is uh, stop thinking of a magic convention as a lost weekend where you can't make money. Think of it as a trade show that you are there and you're, you're, you're if not your primary, but your dual uh, thing that you're looking for is networking. You are, a, uh, you are there to, if, you, if you're there and you, you, you piss around with your mates, having a drink, all those things, if you're at the bar, and you recognize someone. Now, you don't want to be quite as targeted at this, but if you buy someone a pint for a fiver and you end up talking about magic and there's some level of connection, if you know who that guy is or, and you're slightly warm and you build some sort of relationship, he might end up giving you two grand's worth of work that year. Like that's, now you can't think of it just as cold and dead eyed as that. But pretty much, you know, uh, uh, um, there are friends of mine that, that I met pretty much like that. And, you know, we've, exchange work we've given gigs to each other for for years and years and i probably get 30 percent of my work from other magicians and it's so when one of the things that um alan hudson always sort of jokes about is when when, when people say i can't make it to insert a magic convention i'm working you know and then the, the right answer to that is oh i'm doing all right i'm not that worried about missing one weekend which is a great gag to anyone that says i'm drowning in you know i, I can't make it because i'm doing all the all my gigs each their own, everyone can do it however they like. But, you know, a magic convention for me, if you do it all the time, maybe not, but if, you know, just those those times, knocking it around with your mates, uh, being in the company of it, thinking of magic almost as a sort of, or convention as a retreat, sort of just a, a cleansing time where where you're, you're into the playtime of magic, not necessarily the business side of it. And like I said, if you happen to have a conversation with someone that you recognize, uh, buy them a drink, never know. What I'm really saying is next time everyone sees me at Blackpool, buy me a drink. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and what do you drink so people know to what to get uh, Jack and Coke. No ice. No ice oh. important. Did, were you the guy that made the video that got, gets played every Christmas about... Yeah. Oh, this, oh. For those viewers that don't know, in the UK, there's this thing that happens every single Christmas in the run-up in sort of late November into December... Everybody posts photos every single night on their on their Facebook page going, this is my office for tonight. And it's just, it, it's, it, the video that you did, I'm going to try, is it still on YouTube? Because I want to be sure, I'll send you the link here. I, I can't remember where I've got it, but I've got it on a private link. But I, normally on the 1st of December, I will post it. And it's, it's sort of, I think it's, it was funny the first time, but then it starts being almost sort of secondary funny when you're expecting it, like the Coca-Cola advert or something like that. So... Yeah, it's um, it's a girl singing um, uh, a silly little um, rhyme, but it's super addictive. And as soon as I hear it the first time that year, it's in your head. It's a proper earworm. It will drive you nuts. It's Christmas time, man. I did a gig, you did not. I did a gig, you did not. How do you like my office for tonight? Hashtag magician tweet tweet. Absolutely. But I think that just shows your sense of humour and the type of person you are, that you spent time and effort to put this video together. <laughs> it was. Well, I remember the, the girl that did it. So I'm a big fan. There's a website called Fiverr, Fiverr with two R's, which some of you guys might know about. If you don't, it's, it's a great place to go to get bits and pieces, electronic bits and pieces done. If, like I was saying earlier, I'm not the man for all of those uh, multiple skills, but I certainly know how to get things done if, I, if I'm if i not the man to do it. 
So I'll often go to that website. And I remember, I, I mean, I've lost hours, nearly close to days on that website, but I found this girl doing this singing silly little songs. And I thought, I can use this. I don't know where, you know, maybe it'll be something for a trick or a, a bit on my website. And for the time, it was like five bucks for her to sing the song. And now she's, she's pretty successful. She's a sort of singer songwriter and doing okay. And um, I looked online and it was something like 500 bucks for her to, uh, to do a 10 second little joke ditty. Cause I thought about doing a new one last year, like an updated one because um, of the, the virus. And uh, you've got a gig at home, sort of some silliness like that. I thought, I think it's funny, but it's not 500 bucks funny. No. So uh... <laughs> that's awesome. That's brilliant. So, so let's continue with the career. So you've, you've uh, become unemployed. You've then become a full-time magician. You've become very successful very quickly. You've networked. Did you, that, actually one more question about that. Did you join the magic circle early on? This is something I always ask magic circle members. Would you advise? I, I, I wanted to join pretty much. I remember in my early days when I, in, in, so in my first sort of run, when I was dead interested in magic, but hadn't properly gone nuts about it, I remember going to Davenport's and um, I went to there and I think it was Roy and he said, um, I, he said, how much money have you got? I was with my dad. I said, I've got 30 quid. He said, congratulations, this is what you've bought, um, which I'm not entirely sure that's how it should be in a magic shop. But, um, and he gave me a coin and bottle, a Sven deck and a Tenyo trick and some, some bits and pieces like that. And he said, you've got a little bit of money left over. Um, I'm going to get what you should get is six months subscription to Abra, which turns out was a terrible thing to give to a 13 year old um, because it was just lots of middle aged men with gold chains um, talking about their, their, their the magic dinners. And I'm thinking all I wanted was tricks. Just give me tricks. And but I would get this each week and I'd read about it. I see about the magic circle. And I thought, wow. And Paul Daniels would talk about it on the TV show. And, and I knew and also. The brand, I, I think the brand is still very, very strong. But when I was a kid, it was rock solid. So it was something that people talk about. So if ever I did a trick after they do their Paul Daniels and Debbie McGee sort of jokes, it was straight on to the magic circle. Have you been? Um, obviously, as a kid, I, you know, I couldn't have been, but they, they wanted to know about it. And the top question, is it a real place? All those things. And I thought, I will join there. So I probably joined best, yeah, probably early 2000s. Hmm. Uh, but I remember thinking, I want to be, I remember getting in my head thinking, I want to be proper, like, phys like I, I was terrified. I thought it's going to be impossible. I can't join, little old me. And I, um, I started working on an act that, truth was, beyond me, like, really crazy, incredibly uh, heavy sort of sleight of hand routine, a mixture of different things I'd seen. I'd bought videos and books and just, it was, it was jam-packed with magic. But I did it. it I uh, thankfully they let me in but I remember thinking I've I've this is a daft way to play it the right answer is do what you know and do it well rather than trying to be um you know if you're ready for fism you're ready for fism but fism and magic circle are not the same place uh, just go and do a good act and do it well and keep your nose clean and don't you know keep your head up and smile that but, yeah was gonna be my, that was going to be my next question because I, I see a lot of people ever since they did the magic circle unlocked there's been a real big interest in the magic circle and I'm speaking to a lot of magicians and they're going, I really want to enter. I really want to apply, but I'm scared of auditioning. I, I, I don't think I'd do it. And I was going to say, as somebody that's been involved in the circle for the best part of 20 yeah. years, what advice? I mean, I was, I was, I really was terrified before. Um, and I, and I thought, how can I get in? What do I need to do? I, I know it's, it's going to be so hard. And I worked myself into a sort of nervous wreck thinking about it. And if I could go back, if I really could use a time travel app, I would go back and say, just chill out. It'll be fine. Pick three tricks you can do well. I mean, it's not quite as simple as this, but, you know, a card trick, a coin trick and something else. Uh, write some, you know, original lines. Keep your head up. Do them as well as you possibly can do. And, finger, and you know, with a following wind, you'll be OK. Um, it's um, the, the, the standard is above what you would expect at the local magic club but it is not insurmountable. You, everyone, if you're interested in magic and you've been in magic for a couple of years or even you know, a year or so, then maybe you could start to look to, to joining. It is um, uh, certainly well worth it. And now is the time because they're doing yeah. the auditions online. 
It's oh, so, so I'm one of the examiners on that, and it's 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 great. You, you can just do it home because there's something exciting about going to the circle. But if it's your first time doing it, and there's you know I've been the guys in the front row. I mean, I would not want to do magic in front of me. It is, um, and I'm but doing it online. If you if you can get it done before before the world starts again, I mean even if you can't, it's still a great place to join. But uh, the, the these um, these video exams. Um, they are they're they're great you know you haven't got to go you're in a comfortable environment that you know if you rehearse it a thousand times you will be in within one centimeter of every you know your, your hands will be in the same location every single time just practice 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 you know and just uh, and uh, and you'll be okay that's that's really great advice and I've, I've been saying on the channel i said on the michael fitch interview everyone should join right now now is the yeah. time well, 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 it's, yeah. well there's so much great stuff. And now, even if you live miles away, you know, there's quite a few members from Europe and the US. If you live miles away, there's still there's great lectures. Um, there's we've been doing TMC TV every week for uh, uh, if there hasn't been a proper lecture, you know, a lecture lecture, then there's been this TMC TV, like a magazine show, like the one show, but with magic. It's been great. There's a Facebook group and there's a magazine. So there's loads of stuff. So if you were a distant member in the past, you wouldn't get to go see the lectures. Now, lectures are explained. You know, you, you've, got a, you've got a lecture once every couple of weeks and there is great content. And if you're buying from a magic shop, it might be 30 bucks for each one of these lectures. You'll get a couple of those a month. So um, yeah, it's well worth it. The importance of networking, what a great place to network. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, if I'm there and I'll talk to my mates and bits and pieces, but if someone says hello and, you know, uh, uh, we start a conversation and I don't know who they are, I'm interested to know like you know I, I like to think if I was at a magic convention if someone's been in magic for five years I fancy I probably would know their name mm -hmm. so you know even if we don't know each other saying hello all those bits and pieces if he's if you know says I live in the Midlands and I don't get to come to London very often but I get lots of inquiries for London okay great I want to talk to him you know or even if it's just or I'm, I'm a, a gimmick maker or whatever your passion is there's there's in my head I've got almost a Rolodex in my head of different people who've got different specialisms. So I've got, you know, a great relationship with Dave Bonsall, who's a phenomenal uh, uh, close-up magician, but also builder in the shop and things like that. So Dave's made great stuff. I've got mates who are brilliant at uh, gimmick making and 3D printing and all those things. And I want all, I want to know as many, any, as many experts as I possibly can in those different areas. So, um, so if I've got put something together and it needs, uh, a physical prop or a gag or needs a director different people who are experts in those different things going brilliant i'll make some phone calls and see what can happen perfect that's that's brilliant advice um so you then after having you know you're continuing with your successful career you then decide to start creating and releasing magic um and i've got a couple of questions on this i want to talk to you about some of your releases but the first thing that I want to say for anybody who's not seen any of Noel's creation, if there was an imaginary meet, uh, sort of meter in magic, and on one end you've got Sanders, and on the other end you've got Sankey, in terms of the amount of content that gets produced and the varying levels of quality, you're 100% sitting squarely in the Sanders end, my friend. In yeah. the, you release very little, but whenever you do, it is incredibly strong. Um, I and it's, it's so true and it's brilliant. So my first question is, why did you feel the need to start creating magic and releasing it to the magic community, especially when it's very unique and it's very you? Um, you know, you, it's not like you needed the money. You, you're very successful. You, 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 we've talked about how well you're doing as a professional magician. And then all of a sudden it's like, right, I'm going to start releasing magic now. How, what, where did that decision come from? So it's an interesting thing. I mean, creativity, um, which is something that I'm, you know, people have been very kind and sort of known for uh, now. But um, I didn't realise, no one, if you have got, you know, I've got reasonable self-esteem, but, you know, in the early days, it wasn't brilliant. And I didn't think of myself as a creative magician. I just thought of myself as a magician. I didn't think there was even a category of creative magicians. I knew there was, like you said, Sankey and Sanders and always uh, sort of the, uh, sort of, we're always uh, thinking of those amazing magicians who come to lecture uh, at, at Blackpool, those sort of big stars. I thought I'm not one of those. I can just I'm, I think about magic more than most. But eventually, I went and I and I, and I think about it more and more. And eventually, I, I thought I quite fancy making this. And it was it's really just a muscle that needs working. Some people say they're not creative. 
The answer is open your eyes. Everyone is now. Yeah, maybe you might end up not being the most prolific creator. Indeed, I'm not either. But open your eyes. It's all out there. If you turn on the TV and you start looking at an advert now and you'll see uh, I seen one not long ago. And there's uh, in fact, the other day, a uh, piece of paper. And it's not a magic trick. It's just an advert. It's a piece of paper. It's crunched up. Someone waves the hands with a top, you know, almost like a close up match shot. Waves the hand, And now it's a, a flat piece of unruffled paper. And it's just done with an edit and it's a camera trick. But all of those things, if you go through life looking at what looks like a magic trick and thinking, oh, wow, that's cool. I, I like I like that as a visual or even on a movie. You know, the, the, the baddie is a, 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 a can do this thing where he sticks your, his finger in someone's ear and he can read their thoughts or whatever. These weird things, even if they're weird and wonderful, it doesn't matter what they are. Open your eyes, look everywhere. Music, films, TV shows, adverts, all of this stuff. It's a start of a magic trick. And I remember, uh, certainly when it came to iDeck, was the first thing I put out. I remember thinking of, the very first thing I thought of was, uh, uh, iPods had been a thing for a couple of years, and I thought of iPod Shuffle. And it just stayed in my head, and I was like... And I thought, uh, and one of the things I all do, always do for creative things is, if I can think of the, uh, either the finish of the trick or a, or a strong joke, I'm off to the races. So I'll often look on image search uh, if I'm, if I, if I, I do a lot of tricks with, um, with Apple stuff and things like that. So I'll put Apple and funny afterwards and you'll find memes and bits and pieces and stock things and, and things like that. But you might come across something that's genuinely funny. Um, and then you think, all right, if that's already funny at the end, what happens if I work backwards and make it into a magic trick? So I know that, you know, whatever, uh, it, it's a big phone or it's a, um, just wh wherever the funny finishes or a, um, a trick with an apple and half an apple and half an orange, uh, whatever dark things like that, you go, that made people laugh and stop and click through just on an image. If that's the end result, then I can work on that to be a magic trick. So when it came to, I thought of that joke and I thought, I'm going to turn this into a trick. And it just rolled it around in my head for a couple of months. And, and then I was like, okay, so I've got a deck of cards and the songs and it went from there. And then eventually with uh, Pete and Ardy was a great help, but, um, and Nick Einhorn, but sort of pieced all of it together. I thought, oh, I've got a trick I can, you know, release. And I'd had other things before, but I'm very bad at finishing projects. So uh, that was the first thing that with the help of others, I managed to finally finish it. And you know what? I'm going to tell you right now. I, I, we spoke off camera about it. In fact, we've spoke live in person about this. I did that routine for so many years. Um, it was just so commercial. Because I think one of the things that you need with a magic trick is a hook. We've all been there where you bring out a pack of cards and go, pick a card. I've seen that one. Well, no, you probably haven't. This, there was such a hook because you bring this thing out, you talk about iPods, immediately everyone, even if they don't like magic, they're on your wavelength at that point. And, and it was probably the first example, or at least I can think of, of using music in close-up magic, not in a competition style way, yeah. but in a sort of a musical reveal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. No, thank you. It's 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 one of those things. I think when I'm looking for it with a magic trick, that's good advice for anyone. Which is that you are looking for something where the presentation. If you walked up to a stranger in the pub, and uh, so with iDeck, I would always introduce it as I've got the uh, first generation iPod here. This is before they started turning to an electronic thing. And it was a deck of cards. If you just said that someone straight, if you had enough belief and you went to a pub, they if they bought into that, they'd be like, oh wow, really? Like it's the hook is strong enough that you could tell it someone without a magic trick happening. Um, and you could just say, this, this is a thing. So, you know, if you talk about you know my grandfather's coins or something like that, like no one's going, oh wow, that's that 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 story is worth sharing just on its own. Build tricks and hooks that are so compelling that a magic trick doesn't have to happen off the back of it. Like it will, but if it's so good already, then that's, that's really exciting. You think, oh yeah, I've got a fun thing, like the full last trick, you know, the idea of a time travel app that you can ring any point in time. If that really existed, that would be amazing. And, and so, so just explaining that as a hook, even if you write it down and you emailed someone and said, this is a thing, if they bought into the idea of it, they'd be intrigued. And I think that's the key thing. All the advice that you're giving here about creativity, it's not just about creating the method. It's not just about the technique. It's, it's about creating 
the, the the presentation behind it as well because you've got i mean we'll talk about fools later on but the whole idea of a time travel app is something that people get excited i mean first of all everyone talks about apps anyway but secondly yeah. it's it's just it's just such a believable concept that people would work it's just it's perfect it's absolutely perfect no people people have such belief in um in, 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 in the amazing properties of phones and things. I remember, I've told this story before, but I was at the bus stop years ago and there was an old lady there and she said, do you know what time the bus is coming? And I said, oh, uh, uh, I, and then I pulled out my phone and I was going to check uh, the online listings for the bus time. And five seconds later, the bus comes around the corner and she said, oh, wow, thanks for calling the bus. She thought I pressed a button on my phone and the bus arrived. And that was 10 years ago. And like, now, clearly that to us is ridiculous. But again, a cool setup for a magic trick. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just, you know, press a button and the thing arrives? And, you know, there are tricks that are a bit like that. But that was a, a magical thing for her. And I started thinking, people have such investment in phones. If you aren't sure of uh, where you're going to go with a routine, sticking the idea that it is some woolly science techie thing, it's so, it's so believable. It'll, even if not completely believable, it's, they will smile through it but they, they'd love if it did exist. That's perfect. And how important would you say is understanding your character in this whole process? Because you've got a very unique character. You know, you talk about techie and geeky stuff and it, I, I don't, I'm not going to call you a geek, but you've kind of got that geek kind of, yeah. like, it's a bit like Tom Crosby. You know, he made himself yeah. the performing nerd and that's when he blew up, when he yeah. created that character. Would you say that's important as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, and I've said this for years, but the greatest gift you can have as a magician isn't the you know the best classic class or or whatever is is understand how you are and how others perceive you, and you can you've got two choices: either go with it massively or massively go against it. So uh, so if you are you're the guy you know you look incredible in a tux and you're doing a uh, a, a dove routine or something whatever you or you're doing sort of Hollingworth style. A debonair magic then that's uh, uh, people will say oh i see you as mr slick you're beautiful it's, you're going for sophisticated sleight of hand but if you're a comedy magician and you look like a million bucks and you're still and you're doing that kind of thing you can play that for brilliant laughs like that's because you, you're massively going away you either go with it and you're sort of channing pollock and you're or you're hollingworth and you're it's beautiful and it's exquisite magic but if you turn the dial and you go against how they see you then you've got brilliant comedy, or certainly the start of brilliant comedy. So I was the, the, the techie, the nerdy side for me, even though, in full disclosure, I'm not the most techie guy in the world. Uh, I certainly, I love it, but I, you know, I can't design apps. I can't, you know, I got all those bits and pieces. I'd love to be able to do. I can't do those things. Uh, but um, I can, I can certainly t talk a good game if I'm presenting it as a magic trick. And those, so those things, I realised people perceive me in that way, which is, going back to what we talked about earlier, that uh, that director that I was speaking to, and, and she said, I see you as this, and it's uh, fun, inventive, and nerdy, and uh, humorous, and, and fun. That's how I see you, and you need to focus your energy into develop that as the performance character. And when I started to put my energy into that, that's when uh, things started to do better. And I, and I realized then every trick I did, and every or everything I thought about was informed by who I was and how others perceived me. So either go with it, or go massively against it, but either it's fine, just don't be stuck in the middle. That's the worst thing you can do. That's brilliant yeah. advice. Now, on that subject, can we put an urban legend to rest here? Because I remember about the same time that IDEC came out, everybody I spoke to at every convention, at every lecture, at every single time I met a magician, everyone was talking about something that you were doing. And they were talking about this in insane prediction that was like something like somebody named anything and it was in an envelope in your wallet or something along those lines. I got a slightly different yeah. variation every time. And I never got a chance to see it. I was so frustrated. I even found myself trying to track you down so that I could be at the same place with you. So I could see this bloody trick that everyone was talking about. And, and for about a year or two, everyone was talking about this, like, this is going to be the hottest thing in magic. This is Noel's next release. This is going to be broke. This is going to the game changer. And then, it all just fizzled away. Can you tell yeah. me? Can we? So I'll tell you the, the I'll tell you the effect 
um so it started i think you so you might have heard about it in the early days where it, it changed a lot but what it, it became the effect was um i would say to someone um i'm a big time hollywood film producer i just do this magic thing just to keep myself grounded which you know sort of funny setup and then um i want to have a think of who would be good to play you in a film of your life um now before we go any further that is an example of the kind of thing that's a hook but i think if you if you went to a dinner party and you said to someone Go on, who's going to play you in a film of your life? All of our egos start going, oh, I don't know. You could look, I, I started that trick before and it took me in social situations an hour to get to the actual trick because people start to go off to the races. Like it's a, you know, there's other people will chip in with joke answers, either slightly insulting answers, your own, if you know movies, you're interested, maybe you've thought about it before, but it's an interesting question, especially, if, you know, we've all got a certain ego to a certain extent. So it was, who would play you in a film of your life? Then I would, they would say so if we were doing it for you Greg who would it be uh, uh you know what you spot. when I was a, when I was a when I was a kid I'm the same age as this guy I look nothing like him now <laughs> but before I like got bigger like I am now I used to look a lot like the karate kid when we were about the same age I used to look a lot like him geeky glasses mad hair I used to look a lot like and everybody used to say oh my god you look just like the uh the karate kid so if it was wow. younger than me well, I've, I've got good news for you you're definitely not the same age because I've watched a lot of I think he might be 61 now so it's incredible he's never aged a day but yeah it's um Ralph Macho is um, it does he looks great he looks really good unless you are and you look very good for it if you are um uh, so um so all right so Ralph Macho okay brilliant so and then I would say um, and how much money do you want for the rights of your life? And you would fill in the contract here. And I would say, you know, there's been in the last year, there's been 300 films released and, you know, there's, uh, and extrapolate that out. There's been tens of thousands of movies over the last 40 years. And you said you wanted for Ralph Macho. Um, I say, you can't make it today. But I have, he said, if I can't make it to give something to Craig, and I reach in my pocket and pull out um, a, a frame, a photo frame with a photograph of Ralph Macho um, in there. And I'd give that to you to keep and that was the uh the uh that was the that was the trick that i did and i i would do that at uh, close at, at um at gigs as a that either the gig the trick to get the gig or the um or i do it as just one more thing as i'm about to leave i didn't i never did it 10 times a night because it was too special and it's what if you do it 10 times a night even though i could it would water it down exponentially it is i can't believe i've seen this Years ago, people would talk about um, Balducci's levitation and it would be done in a room. That originally, it was done in a room for one person, the booker, the main man, and he would leave and tell everyone about it and they would experience this miracle that happened uh, in their own mind, really. They'd say he levitated 10 feet and I wanted that some of that goodness where they seen this trick and they would go off and tell people and, you know, how, how do you spin that story? We've all heard other magicians talking about or I had lay people talking about tricks that they've seen from other magicians and they recount it and it's bullshit. It is, you, you know, it didn't happen though. You know, he didn't snap his finger, a bottle appeared and he pushed it through the table. And in the end it was, it had my signed playing card inside where you can, you can think of 10 tricks all put together. And the same thing with this is people would see it. And then afterwards I'd get phone calls and say, um, I have seen this and they'd make it even more amazing in their mind. And that's so it was it was it was the it was the miracle trick I did at the end of a show or a magic convention. Wow. And how come it didn't get released? And do you still I, the truth is the truth is I didn't want to release I, I went through different stages. I half wanted to release at one point. And I um uh it was my concern was gonna be that I didn't want slightly offensive now, I didn't want some ratty kid at Blackpool coming up to me uh saying uh cool trick man but like you know just whatever it is they'd, they'd like it but it'd be slightly defame it they'd, they'd say something slightly shitty about it and i thought do you know what I'm, i could make some money from this but if it's my special thing then i want to keep that uh, forever and, and i and i could have released it but it would have it would have weakened it and then if i'm the guy at a gig doing that trick no one's coming behind me to do that trick um i'm going to get the gig and I did, and it was that special weapon that I had in my arsenal, and I didn't want to ever uh, uh, let that go. So that was the reason why I never released it. Do you still do it now? Do you know what? I haven't done it for ages. I, I, it's probably about two years ago since I last did it, but that's only because of 
you know, it's like when you start to get into a set and you're, the clothes you're wearing dictate the material you're doing. So um, uh, I haven't done it for a while, but it's always in the back of my mind. And I've, a guy rang me, in fact, not long ago, probably just before Christmas, and he wanted to put me for a virtual show. He said, I've still got that photograph of the actor. I, it's my, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm that anecdote when he's in the company of, when they watch a magic show or something like that, I'm the thing that gets trotted out, which is wonderful. We've all had the other way around where someone said, oh, we've seen this magician and they tell a story about someone else. But eventually all of us will be the person that's the story is told about. We just never get to hear it. He said, look, I've had this. I never let it go. It's been in my wallet for 10 years. It's in, you know, just a, a miracle. And that's the reason why I wanted to, to uh, come and do my 40th, uh, my wedding anniversary. Well, you know, it's another example of what you were talking about. Make people remember you. You know, be the person that everybody wants to remember. Cre create, it, and it's hard, you know, as much as magicians like to believe it, having a signed card that's half covered in beer, here you are, you can have that as a souvenir. That's not going to be something that people hold on to forever. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, maybe in certain situations. But, you know, I think striving to create that trick that's going to create that personal yeah. memory forever. That's so important. Like, I think if you want to create, like, you know, just you saying that now, and, and it's a good starting point, um, we're all, we've all learned, and we've seen on the back of enough DVD boxes and, 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 and tricks and bits and pieces saying there's this uh, uh, lovely giveaway and it's an amazing giveaway. What if you had a starting point was what the giveaway was and then you worked backwards to create a magic trick around it? So you, you know, again, go to image search. So I would look at, uh, I would search cool object impossible object now you'll see a lot of things that are magic tricks that are you know, it's just they've been tagged on image search but somewhere someone's been messing around with photoshop and they've or they've they've thought something fun and it's just somewhere but you know you'll see something as an image you're like oh wow cool and again going back to what i said earlier that is something that they were so interested in that they thought i will knock this up in photoshop it will make someone laugh it's a funny idea that that's so impossible if you can find a way to produce that then uh, that, that impossible object you knew it was amazing to start with you, when you've when you've seen it. Now you've physically got it. Then you can build a trick around it. We can all build a trick around the finish. Once you know the finish, work backwards. It's one way of doing it. And that's really important advice. I think one of the things that a lot of magicians struggle with when they're creating magic, whether it be to release or whether it be for their own act, it's finding that initial inspiration, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's, it's out there. And like you, you, if you know who you are, and it goes back to, to what I said earlier, if you know who you are, and you've got that that excitement and you're you're searching for those those routines also like for me i want material that's the polar opposite to what i'm what i'm doing i think of if you're doing five minutes of magic for a group of people think of them each as a superpower um and if you've proved one superpower no one's if you know if superman suddenly arrived and he flew around as amazing as that is he's proved he can fly like you i mean you'd still be super impressed but it doesn't get any more impressive. The first time you see it, it's amazing. So the same thing. So if you can bend something, you've got one trick where you bend something, something reappears in another, uh, and it's signed and it's an impossible location. You've got one trick like that. You don't need five. Uh, you, um, if you've got one card trick, you know, there's anyone, they can work however you like, but for me, one great card trick, that's what I'm doing in that set. Just, so those things, I want every routine to be the polar opposite to the last thing, just a million miles away from it. So if I'm doing sleight of hand in, the, in, in one trick, the next trick, they're doing it. Say, so, okay, so you thought I was doing it all before, now you guys are gonna do it. Or something like, so things like that, I think are interesting and worth chasing. Make it as different as it possibly can be. Absolutely. And, and the, the, the most recent thing that you've created that you released to the magic community was the Bill in Sharpie, wasn't it? Which yeah. is an example of your creativity when it comes to, the technical side of things or the methodology, because I've seen so many bills in Sharpies. I've seen some very simple versions. I've seen some very complicated versions, but I've never seen anything that makes me feel like James Bond before I saw your method. I mean, it is insane what you came up with there. It, it is, I, I think the ultimate bill in Sharpie, I, I really do. I think it, the method is fantastic. And I, 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 you know, from when I saw you at that gig a little while ago, just before COVID, I do that routine. I. Yeah. It's it's such a strong trick, it really is. Oh, thank you. No, it's it's something I'm super proud of. When I remember, um, I think I was talking to Andy Gladwin. It was a long ass time ago, and he mentioned he might have mentioned about um, them doing a deal with Nick to to release his 
the, the, the one that Nicodor originally bought the rights from, but that's that Bill and Sharp, or that Bill and Pen. And I'd, I'd, I'd put into my head that I wanted to do a, uh, a, a banknote routine with, um, with three different phases. And I was thinking I'm going to do pen through as the one phase. Um, I can't remember where it was going. Maybe there's a tall and restored aspect, and then the finish was going to be Bill appears in the in the in the sharpie. But I set my heart on it being a regular sharpie, and I knew that years before I had seen a um, uh, well, I'd give a, a tiny part of the method away, but I'd seen um, uh, something. I think it was a a ring flight with the lid of a uh, sharpie. And it was, I think, probably just some elastic attached to the um, the clip. And I remember thinking, well, Sharpies, you know, work. They're designed to be put together. And someone at the shop, the manufacturing plant has to put the things together or machines put them together. I was thinking, maybe that's a starting point of a method. And then I started to explore it. And my first thing always is go to gaffer tape, see if I can produce a prototype. Because like I said, I'm not the, uh, the man for physically uh, making these things, although I do fancy... 3D printing and all that world, but I went to gaffer tape immediately. Then I went to 3D printing. Then I went to uh, Dave at Prop Dog, who's uh, a brilliant friend and wonderful. And Dave, off the 3D plans, produced a prototype. And then I went back and forth, back and forth. I had it was years and years and years in the making. And um, and each time I'd get it and I'd work it and I'd work it, I find some little issue, and eventually. I decided I was going to have the thing uh, injection molded. And if you know anything about manufacturing, that is an insanely expensive way to produce something. And a lot of people said, you're crazy. But I knew I wanted it to be, it was going to be a high end item because it was done to the highest level. So I had the thing manufactured in China. It cost a lot of money, but I was, you know, I, I went full on it, a big commitment to it because I knew it was for me, the perfect answer and would be something the magicians would be excited about and, and they had the, the white magnetic uh, sort of closing box, which I know will always uh, get some excitement. So for me, it was a, it was it was a it was great magic product, but also was a good solution for working magicians. And it's still available now for the people. It is, yeah, absolutely. Do you sell it directly through your own website? I do. Yeah, it is. Oh, uh, that is. And I'll put it down here now. Uh, Blissmagictrick.com. There you go. And, and it's so, yeah. Highly recommended. Uh, I've actually you. performed it on this channel. It's brilliant. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, but I think that that is the, in that story that you told is a golden nugget of advice there, which is if you are creating magic to release to the magic community, don't be the guy that gets an idea in the morning, films it on an iPhone in the afternoon and uploads it as a download in the evening. Be the guy that puts his heart and soul into making it the best product that it can be. Absolutely. I, I don't want anyone saying about anything. I, there's two things I want. As well as say it's a great magic trick, I want them to say, oh yeah, only Noel could have come up with that. That for me is like bang on. So there's some level of either a clever method thing or a quirkiness or a humour to it or something like that. Because when people talk about great musicians and things like that and they say, oh yeah, I just heard the beginning of the song and I knew it was you. And, you know, I knew it was that, whichever act it is. I want that with my magic. I want people to say, it could only be Noel. Um, you know, certain tricks, you said, you mentioned Richard Sanders before, you see one of his creations and you go, I know this is so polished, so tight, that only he could have come up with it. It is, it is exactly, <clears throat> it's the perfect answer for the right time. Same thing with me is, I will not stop until it's perfect. And also, I will go to effort. I've, I've always been like this, but I'm fairly, fairly low key normally. But if I get going on an idea, it's everything to me. It, it becomes all consuming. And I do not mind going to un wildly unreasonable effort, just insane effort, um, if it will produce the desired results. And that's, that's, that's the way it should be, really, if you, especially when you're putting your reputation on the line, like you say that you yeah. are. Um, I, I know, circling back very quickly to the prediction in the, in the frame, I've just thought of a question that I know I'm going to get in the comments over and over again. So I want to answer it here. I want to get it here. Would you ever consider putting that routine out um, at some point down the line? I just, I'm just, I'm thinking through this interview as we're doing it, and I just know I'm going to get blasted with this question. So, yeah, I mean, well poss poss it. possibly is the answer. Uh, there'd be some things to overcome, but the answer is possibly. And I, because I'm a sort of magic creator, I often get drawn to the um, 
a shiny new thing. So I've always got 10 ideas in my head of new things. And, you know, I'm I, in, in my head, there, there are different stages along to possibly being released. Some of them are the latest dark thing. I thought, oh, cool. I never thought that fitted together. And, and right up to things where I'm thinking about getting those manufactured or prototypes. So the right answer is just get an idea, finish it. Get, if, if it's a good idea, it's finding out if it's a, if it's a winner, but finding those golden ideas, check with your mates. Don't just get them blowing smoke up your ass. If, it, if it's a stone cold winner, put that at the top of the page. That is the one you get finished. You, you wake up, you don't stop. I don't follow my own advice, but you, that's what you absolutely should do. And then everything else, you put them in order. So, okay, first, first thing that's closest, that's real, that is achievable. Um, I've got a trick I'm thinking about at the moment that requires, uh, for the, for the, for the gimmick to be made, you need to go to the kitchen. And there's a, you know, I won't do any more than that, but like uh, they, they might have to do a little bit in the kitchen to produce the gimmick each time. And I know that is uh, something that's going to be longer because there's, there's a food element to it. If I was going to release it, there's a lot of uh, bullshit that needs to go uh, to get, I need to get past for that to come out. <clears throat> I've also got, you know, if you think of a, a, a great trick and it's uses a, a blank, you know, blank deck of cards or whatever it is, that is an achievable thing. You can get that done, but put that at the top of the list. Get, get the things done in the right order. Great advice. And, and for somebody who is planning on releasing magic, would you suggest doing it yourself like you did with Bliss? Or would you suggest going for a dealer like you did with IDEC? Uh, so I think I've, uh, there's, two, there's two options. I, for me, I put out uh, IDEC and Alarmed with uh, Pete Nardi, who was great. And, um, and the thing is with, with there's so much magic out there now. I mean, seemingly, you know, Murphy's or some dealers always send you an email of the new tricks. And I think if you're new to the market and you want to put something out, I would consider going with a dealer that you trusted, uh, certainly for the first um, routine, first couple of routines, just so people go, oh yeah, that guy, I remember him. He's the guy from that trick. <clears throat> you know, you won't make a ton of money, but they will hold your hand, the dealer. They will make good money. You make some money, but... Uh, the, the 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 exposure you'll be yeah. featured in magazines you know people like you and steve faulkner and all these different people will talk about it you will get even if it's a small reputation you will get that reputation um, uh, as a creator and if it's good stuff then at that point you know uh, 18 months two years three years from then you can go out and put your own uh, uh, stuff out because people will say oh yeah i like that guy and you know in order to put out your own stuff you're going to need some money uh, depending on what it is if it's a packet trick you might be okay but I think when Bliss was produced, it probably cost best part of twenty thousand pounds. So that's one hell of a risk. Yeah. So that's a punt. So you know, but you could also just as easily, like I said, you come up with a trick with a you know a rubber band and, and a paper clip. It could you know it could be anything, but um, you know it's uh, you, you've got to really back it and you've got to think this is a winner. And in the early days, I would consider going with a dealer that you trusted. Um, and certainly until you've got your, your name and your reputation cemented. Well, two dealers that you've mentioned in this interview is Dave from Prop Dog and, and, and Peter from Alakazam. And I know both of those guys. One of the things that they both do is if a product needs work, they'll happily help you with it and, and refine oh, it. And, 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 and yeah, both great, great when friends. Both creating magic, it's so important to <clears> have <throat> somebody like that. Well, everyone, you can't, you can't do it in a vacuum. Like I said, even... Like the, the certain strengths I know that I've got certain strengths I, I think I'm pretty good at coming up with a hook for a magic trick fairly good at method things I'm not as good at routining I'm not as good at several different uh, aspects of it uh, in my slight hand is on the side of acceptable it's certainly not uh, setting the world a, a light so if I need help like I said earlier I've got all these different people I can call on and even if you're a magician even if you live in the middle of nowhere and you think I've got no magic mates join a magic society you know, magic form uh, network find those people find your people the ones who can help you so dave and peter are uh, great magicians but also very used to putting out magic tricks and it's not just as simple as with a trick you might have a way to think oh yeah it could be manufactured like that but if you're going to sell it you need to figure out the best way to, to have it made there's no point in it made being made out of you know silver or you know whatever you, there's, there's there's expensive ways to produce things the truth is the trick will be when, when a trick is released, it's done. In the, the day of release, that is, it's almost dead at that moment. 
So it has got to be, you've got to go big, it's got to be impact and make it, make it as good as it possibly can be, but don't over-engineer, which is what I cl- got close to doing for Bliss. Don't uh, make it so prohibitively expensive, it can't be sold. Again, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant advice. And it's nice to know that you're, there are more things down the line coming from you, Noel. That's good to know because you are one of my favorites. Several, several things. If I can get my finger out, there's several things. I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. You know that I've built a reputation for myself telling the truth. You're very sweet and you've said lots of nice things in the past. It's so, true. Yeah. I, and I'll tell you right now, and you know that I tell the truth about this sort of stuff. You are one of the very, you're on a very small list of people that when I see something that's released of yours, I will happily buy it without seeing a trailer or ad copy because I know that it's going to be clever, it's going to be commercial, and it's going to be well thought out. That's the biggest oh, compliment I can pay you because I Very sweet. No, that's so, I'm, I'm looking for, as I said earlier, some of those things, if not all of those things, in anything I either perform or release because like I said I want people to go, oh yeah, well, only Noel could come up with that. That's, that's a, a very him trick. Yeah, there is, that, that is something that you see through all of your creations it's very qualterish <laughs> i think is the is the term <laughs> absolutely can i ask you one question i'm going to want to talk about foolish next but before i do have you ever entered a magic competition i am not aware of you entering one the reason i ask this is because i've interviewed a lot of people on this channel who are winners of competitions uh henry harris and you know fissum winners and mark oberon and 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 I, I i speak to so many people and they go yeah, you've got to win a competition. You can't be anywhere in magic if you win a competition. And I've been trying to tell people entering and winning competitions is not the be all and end all to be successful. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be that award winning magician. And I'm not aware of you entering or even bragging I about it. Yeah, so I have that. So I, I, I entered the Magic Circle Close Up Magician of the Year for three years. So two things I didn't, I never won. Uh, but I did win the originality award each year I entered it. So, uh, and for me, that's the reason why I entered it. I wanted, I wanted to win, but what I wanted the most was to get the originality award uh, because that was every, like I was sort of saying earlier, everything you do, uh, you want to be able to tell a story. Think of what your goal is. Like, so for your promo, if you want to tell the story that you're a, a, a funny sleight of hand guy, then you need to get that across in everything you do. Uh, or if you're you know, a crazy, you know, uh, a comedy magician, you need to get across in everything you do. I want to get across that I was inventive and fun, uh, and an, yeah, an inventive, clever, fun magician. That was my goal. So doing the Magic Circle Close-Up competition uh, was a great deadline. Um, and I, I had always had a new trick that I was working on. And I've um, so each year I did it, I'd have one sort of signature thing that was the, the thing that I was crazy about that I wanted to demonstrate to magicians. And then uh, I was lucky enough to get the award each year I entered it. Then I uh, uh, stopped doing it. I got the hat trick, didn't bother doing it. And then they um, they dropped the award, so you can't win it anymore. So I think of it like a hat trick, like um, football. I got to keep the the, uh, the ball at the end of uh, my three goes at it. So I have entered competitions. Fair enough. But would you, would you say it's important to be successful to, no? I think, so there's two things. So it depends what you're taking from it. Everything you do should be a reason for it. So, if you, so for me, it was, I quite liked a deadline. I mean, I don't like deadlines, but if they're set up, I will, I will follow them. I will, I, I, especially if it's a serious stuff. And so I wanted to work on that. I thought um, it's a nice way, you know, if, I, if something good comes off it, it's a nice thing to, to talk about to clients and get them excited because they're always interested in the magic circle. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm going to, work on uh, this routine but I really just wanted to demonstrate uh, my new creations to other magicians to put my mark saying this is mine stay away you know if you have anyone had anything similar but also get across my sort of personality but you don't need to, to do it they they like I said they're good for those things but know what you're going in for yeah Excellent. that's like the most but other than that you know if you fancy a competition and there's the local magic club you know throw your, throw your hat in there but uh, but the serious stuff no, you don't need to. And also, like you said, the award winning, it literally means nothing. If you put in award winning magician, that's like putting in Florida man into, into Google. It is, uh, you know, it's just a million hits. It, there's award winning magician. You said Mark Oberon, who's a brilliant uh, magician, a world champion of magic, and not to be confused for the guy that won the pocket trick drive at the, you know, insert a magic club's local society. But 
to a punter, if you're a booker and you see, oh, I've seen a guy in a suit and uh, one's award winning and see another guy's awarded. Okay, oh, they both won awards. Now they are not to be uh, to looked at in, in the same way, but how can you tell the story? How can you convince them that, that one is better than the other? You can say world champion, but you can be sure that the guy at the local club uh, won't mention it's local. He will just say, I was voted sleight of hand champion, or I was voted uh, best new trick, or whatever it is. It'll never come with the, you know, the, the, the brackets of where what the title was. Whereas the guy that won the big one, he will say, but you'll all be seen to be the same. World uh, awards aren't something, they're something to be very proud of, but they will not make the difference because bookers do not care unless you can make it very clear that yours is head and shoulders above all the other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And these days when it comes to, you know, people, when people are inquiring these days, they've already almost made their mind up who they're going to pick and they've based it on videos and, and, mm. and, and show reels and live performance footage and, and social proof and this client and that client and not necessarily awards. So totally, totally 100%. Yeah, I mean, unless you, if you if you say, um, award-winning magician and you won uh, this award and you, you're able to explain why you entered it and you tell the story of it, but just just writing award-winning magician available for weddings, you know, bar mitzvahs, private parties. It, it just sounds like the most generic content in the world. No one cares. Make it special. Make it about you. Like when I won the Originality Awards, I could tell bookers that if you're looking to do a, um, uh, a, present, a new presentation for your uh, a, new, a new product that's coming out and you want to do something custom, you want to get something excited, then I'm the one with the background. I can help to create an original piece of magic to showcase your material. And I still use that to this day. And it's compelling evidence. I won it three times. I can legitimately say that I am in the conversation of the, the more creative magicians in the United Kingdom. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, and they will go, that is a practical thing where bookers can go, oh yeah, we, we're looking to release something this guy knows about putting together uh, uh, custom things. Maybe he could be the guy. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Now let's talk about Fool Us. Um, because obviously, with, uh, you've just, when we're filming this, you've literally just posted about, uh, about on Facebook about fooling Penn and Teller, which is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, let's talk about that. Because there was one you just talked about having a reason to do everything so i'm guessing you had your reasons for entering fool us especially uh, i don't want to say so late in the game but it's been around for like seven or eight yeah. seasons now and you are creative you would have probably had the ability to go in in season one if you wanted to so what made you decide to hold off until this point and two i'd like to talk about the actual routine um uh, but let's talk about your reasons for entering first of all your reasons so the right. truth is i did um I did go in uh, before. In fact, I was uh, the first person booked on Full Us for Series 1 episode, the pilot. I was the first person booked by Johnny Thompson, which I was delivered. Now, obviously, you could think i never seen him. He didn't because I got cut because the trick went wrong. Um, so I, um, in fact, it was the, I was doing the, the routine that we talked about earlier, the prediction trick. I was uh, with the actor uh, and the trick went wrong. And we had to call sound issue on it. And, um, and they said, don't worry, we'll get you back for the series. And I went on and I did it on the series as well. And I got cut from that as well because uh, I had, well, a mixture of my performance wasn't brilliant. And the guy that was on stage looked a little bit like I was pissing on his shoe. He did not look, he did not look uh, particularly happy throughout the routine. That's down to me uh, and, and I know if I was going to do the same routine again, I wouldn't pick one person in isolation because there was there's quite a lot of scripting I needed to do in that routine. If you're just looking straight ahead and, and performing, I'd left this guy for dead. So it's it's on me. Uh, normally I would do that. I'd have done the trick for one person, but I would have also um, uh, uh, made uh, remarks to their wife or partner or the people around them. Because like I said, if you, you introduce the idea of who would be uh, a perfect person to play you in a film of your life, I'm interested in your opinion, but I'm also interested in your wife, girlfriend, boyfriends, what of that, because they've got funny stuff to say. It's a conversation between three or four people. So um, so that's what I wanted. I didn't get that. I just got a guy who didn't look very happy to be there. Um, so unsurprisingly, I got cut from that uh, as well. Trick works, it was all fine, but um, got cut from that. Then I I sort of dropped out. I didn't, I didn't mass, I would watch it, but not, 
uh, not religiously. And then a couple of years passed, I did actually email them two years ago with the same routine or the same, same start of the routine that I did uh, just gone on full us just now. Um, but because I didn't have much time on my hands, I um, sent them a video from the Magic Circle close-up competition where I also performed a version of this trick in that act. And um, then I thought, but at, at the time I sent through this, this video and it just did not capture their imagination because TV people want it all coloured in for them. No point holding back. Here I am, uh, a man in a suit doing a card trick like everyone. Um, and it was a good card trick. It was a you know, very fooling card trick, but it didn't have the fizzy, fun, extra bits and pieces that people are looking for. So that first video, uh, they, they got it. They said, thanks very much. And nothing came of it. And I thought, ah, oh, shame, because I'm you know, certain that would have fooled them, but though these things happen. And then I got an email um, this summer, and they said, have you got, because if, if you've had any communication with them, they will email you. There's nothing special about me. It's like the BGT email, or indeed the, yeah. um, and if you want to do it now, it's fulllosscasting at gmail.com till the 30th of March, I'll do PR for them. So if you've got an idea of something, email them. I'll give you some ideas and some tips on that before we finish. But I wanted to, when I got this email, I thought, you know what? We're all screwed. I've got some extra time. Let me try and think of this as a TV thing because I you know, advise on a few different TV shows. And I thought, let me think about this as an actual, what I what a TV producer would, would want this to look like. <clears throat> so I built this routine um, and I thought about it for a long time. I, I emailed them. I sent them a rough video. And even though they hadn't said yes, I started obsessing over the uh, the extra details, and I um, and I checked in on them every so often, and they said, "Thanks very much. It's a card trick. Um, we've got a bunch. We'll let you know," which is fair enough. That's the right answer, you know. There's just just so many card tricks, and uh, and I kept working on it because I had faith that they were going to come back to me. No reason. I just had faith they would come back to me. I kept working. I and then by the time they said yes, it had been. I think it'd been something like two months from the first submission to, to them saying yes. And I had two weeks to get the trick together, which wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't behind the scenes been doing all of the work, the mental work, if not necessarily the, the grunt work. So the routine was not, it was, uh, it was mentally written in my head and I could spring into action, which is what I had to do, run a million miles an hour for the next, I think it was two and a half weeks, just, you know, just over two weeks to, to get it all ready for, for filming. Well, it's such a great it, it it's such a great premise. It really is. The again, it, it typifies your approach to magic, which is hook them in, get them something relatable, uh, yeah. so comedic, but not in a typical comedy magician yeah. way, with an incredibly strong payoff that well, it fooled the hell out of me. It didn't just fall penny. I give no clue, no clue. Good. Um, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Is this something that you work commercially? I remember watching it. I watched it like three times and I was like, I bet you Noel could work this because the only thing that was typical to Penn and Teller was the image of Penn and Teller. I was like, you could, you could, you could do this to any, any, uh, like person and just like substitute Penn and Teller for a picture of a baby and go, oh, I've gone too far back. Sorry. Let me, you know, there's ways of dealing with it. Uh, is yeah. this something that you actually get? Absolutely. Gave? So I've, I've, so uh, uh, I've done it at Magic Lectures, and, and I've got a slightly different presentation for that, and I've done it um, a couple of times in uh, parlour shows. And if I was doing something like the Magic Castle, I'd definitely do it. Um, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's not a 10 times a night trick, but it's certainly, I could do it in the pub for me and you, and uh, you would see the same thing as they did. I mean, you wouldn't see Piff and you know, Young Penn and Teller, but yeah, exactly. Some, some business would happen, and the, trick, the same trick would happen. So uh, I love so, yeah. seeing Piff in there. That was that that made me laugh out loud at real because I know you you're friends with John. So yeah, uh, it was it was it was great seeing that. That was. Well, I did sort of think like I, I spent a lot of time thinking, um, who would I like? What sort of, what sort of fun things could happen? And I uh, and again going back to hooks, I started thinking. So the my original thought was a, and I think this is still a really fun presentation, <clears throat> but say that there are a bunch of. Uh, magicians because the show's been on for so many years now you can play with a format you can have an interpretation a kind of slight in jokey a little bit clever a little bit knowing you couldn't have done that in the early series <clears throat> but now I thought yeah, maybe you can you can have some fun with it so I thought 
I will tell them that there is a, uh, uh, so a network, a behind the scenes network of all of the magicians that have been on Fool Us and they all work together, sort of like a big tele-sales operation. Um, and if you've got a trick and you're trying to fool them, you ring through, it's a subscription and you say, I'm, uh, uh, hi, I'm looking for a magician to, to help me to, to, to fool them. And you get buzzed through to whoever it will be. So I thought you might get buzzed through. It might be Shin Lin and it might be Piff and it might be Archer and it might be, you'd have a, a, a quick couple of seconds, a little gag. And again, it's, it's sort of knowing. And, and I thought, then I started thinking, okay, what are they doing? So maybe uh, it's like sort of celebrity squares type thing where they're all in a grid and it goes boop, 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 and it lands on, on the guy and you see whatever the joke answer is, it's Shin Lim and he is um, he's doing something you wouldn't expect him to be doing. Um, I don't know what that is, but like, you know, so I, I was always looking for what that would be. And I started to go down that route and then I changed to the time travel thing. I think at one point I had, it was a mixture of the two. And then when I went on the time travel, I started thinking, okay, I thought slightly sort of stacking the odds in my favor. I know that Piff's appearance will get a kick out of them. Mm. And I knew that John's a good lad and he's you know, super funny. And I said to him, just go full tilt at me. Um, you can say whatever you like, because you can swear and they'll bleep it. You can do whatever you want. Um, just come at me hard, like, you know, super aggressive as he does on stage. Um, and uh, and because the stronger that is, the more memorable it is. And I knew that I'd get a laugh. And then eventually I got to young Penn and Teller. I thought that's super exciting. And I knew that, that I wanted to do that, but we were in lockdown. And I was thinking, like normally if you're doing these things, you got the backing of a you know a TV production company and all of what they can do. I didn't have any of that. I had, they said to me, you've got a tiny budget and it was minuscule. And uh, and for your item, you so I was basically a one-man production company. I booked, or originally I booked the um, the uh, the video guys, camera equipment. I was meant to be hiring all of my props, any of the video elements, all of the. Um, uh, the set dressing, any of those things, and the location, all of that had to come out of a minuscule budget. And I've you know, worked on TV shows, just can't happen. You cannot do that without favours. Um, so I, I started to, 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 to chase those, thing, those things. And that took up probably as much time as the routine as the actual the production side that I was working on behind the scenes. It's just It was just so much work. It was wake up early for me like 10 a.m which is pretty early for me but i didn't stop till three or four o'clock in the morning just keep going wow but it paid off it paid off <clears throat> i'm very pleased with it it was uh, uh absolute uh, ton of work and uh like going back to the um to the kids thing like i said to them look you guys are in you in the u.s uh kids in america are just called kids like they're just you know like in, in this country finding kids to do american accents is a bit harder. All you guys have to do is shout out the window, I'd like two children to film a skit on a sofa because they'll all have American accents. That's how it works. But in this country, it's a nightmare. And I had to, I emailed Daryl Rose was good enough to, um, to hook me up um, uh, and with, um, with his son and his friend. And they, they did it. But where was I, you know, no one was coming behind me to, to help. There was, you know, I put out a thing on Facebook and I was lucky to get that. If that hadn't have happened, I'd have had to do something else as a, a bit of funny thing, but uh, it was those terrifying moments when uh, when you think I've got to do all this myself. I'm on my own. I am a one man production company. A lot of people wouldn't have been able to pull that off. That's no. I, I, I like I said, I'm lucky. I've got all these different people. So um, when it came to set dressing, Maria Cork, who's a, you know, brilliant, uh, just a, a great person. She's uh, works in movies. She's uh, uh, works on Star Wars and loads of different things. She's a great uh, uh, prop maker, and she, I don't think it's a secret. She's um, a person who sort of threaded Chewy. So she's um, each individual hair she was uh, sewing on, and she's done great stuff. She and her partner lent me some amazing stuff. So in the background, there's a monkey's head that she drew and a brain uh, that she made and a brain and all this other cool stuff. Because I wanted it to be layered. Like, if you can see it, I want it to be me, and I want it to be fun and and, and novel, and not just. I could have done the same trick in the pub, and um, and it'd be much the same. But I thought I don't mind. I rang round, so I got the props. I rang Dave and said, "Can I come to the shop and and dick around in the uh, in the in the workshop?" And I uh, and they, I worked with the production company who said, "We've we've interviewed you. We've got a script. We've got." The kind of thing we'd like you to say 
and I said, all right, fine, I will script a, um, uh, uh, I'll work out what shots that should look to tell the story that you want to tell. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, what I said to VT is close to the truth, but they, they wanted a, a fun version uh, of that. So they always turn it up to 11. So, so the crazy inventor thing, I thought, okay, well, how do you tell the story of that? Well, you have to go to a workshop, you have to have things exploding and things not quite working and, and playing around with stuff. And what advice would you give for somebody who's considering entering Foolers? Like you say, <coughs> currently auditioning for the next season. Is there any advice based on your experience of yeah. bearing in mind more people watch this in America than in the UK, although it's got a big following Actually, yeah. on this channel? Um, what advice would you give somebody who's considering going on Foolers? Well, the top one, and I've had mates, people who've been in magic for a very long time saying, I couldn't go on, I've got nothing to fool them. Forget about it. It, the show is called Full Lusk in order to get the TV uh, bosses to say yes, to get it commissioned. It has got nothing to do with Full I was lucky enough to fool them, but it's just a TV opportunity. Just go in there. So if you've got a trick, a, a, an act, it needs to be less than five minutes. That's what, that's important. Uh, so that's a hard rule. Um, I would look at uh, the material that, that you've got that's the most you, that's honed, that you know inside out, but also that reflects you. Uh, and has got something new. So that's what they're always looking for, new and shiny. So yeah, I did a car trick, but it had added madness to it, um, as well as, you know, the, the, the method thing doesn't matter. That I didn't have a conversation with Mike Close about the method until three days before I filmed my bit. No one cares. Like, they need, you need to know that before filming, before the show is, 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 is televised, before it's filmed, but no one cares before. It's all about best act, most entertaining, original, innovative, interesting um i would say uh look at the hooks like we've been saying for you know for the whole time what's a really exciting novel hook so we're not looking for um you know if let's say you do um a uh, mcdonald's aces right uh let so if, if that's your trick and you go i do that better than anyone well unfortunately that's not good enough unless you can legitimately say uh, your sleight of hand is world class and uh, whatever the card trick you're going to do you've got to add extra things so i would look at uh where's the right place where's the perfect place to do that um so think of darren brown darren brown's doing a tv special he picks or doing a trick on tv i know he's not done tricks for years but it was always the right trick in the right place for the right person so i'm doing buckaroo with the uh, psychological buckaroo with the mb games boss at the factory at the exact place where they uh where they where they where they make that trick or whatever it is the right trick for the right place or i'm doing a a chess trick and i'm going to do it for the chess champion at the world championships of, uh, of chess so things like that start thinking okay where's the right place so uh where what should your set dressing look like where's the right place what also let's say you are um you want to get across some of your own story so let's say you're a single dad and you're juggling magic and um, and, and sleight of hand practice with uh, being a parent, right? It's a scenario that people will be familiar with. Well, then maybe that can come into your routine, right? Maybe you're doing this card trick and uh, the baby alarm goes off, right? Like I, said, I don't know, I don't know where that trick's going, but it's a, you know, oh, cool. So, so you could say to them in your email to them, you know, feel, you know, this idea, anyone can have this, but they can, can't all go and do it. But something like, I'm, I come across as Mr. Serious, I put on the music and it's sort of shin limits like, you know, rousing music and the baby alarm uh, comes on and I have to try and solve that as well as the uh, the card trick. Now, if you're a producer, you're like, oh, I can see that's something to work with. Now, I don't know what happens and you guys, you know, everyone have to think about their own way, but something, an original hook, something novel, just being good at sleight of hand or just being a good magical operator is not enough. It needs a great hook, something else, some... Uh, unless your trick is phenomenal, added madness, added something, uh, or change the object. You know, instead of you doing coins across, uh, you're doing it with Pringles. I don't know, just you know, just off the top of my head. And then you think, okay, that's that's a method issue, isn't it? You know, right? You know, you're certainly not classic palming Pringles. You know, what what you know those things. And Penn and Teller will go, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm not saying it's a good trick, but it's the kind of thing. Change the object, change the environment, add extra things, uh, make it interesting and different so as when they email each other and i've been in a tv environment they'll get a submission 
uh, the lowest person on the totem pole will botch it first. If it doesn't pass that, it doesn't go any further. If it does, uh, it might have a, a, a thing at the top that says, here is a trick where dot, 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 because they've got, you know, they're busy people, they want a quick summary. If it's got some level of craziness, something interesting, a good hook, uh, or it's, you know, it could just be good old fashioned hilarious. If it's 10 out of 10, amazing magic and 10 out of 10, very funny, then you're okay. But if you know that it's lacking in any way, you've got to add something else. Yeah. That is probably the best advice I've ever heard on this subject ever, Noel, seriously. Thanks. And that is so true. That is so true. Fantastic. Um, I want to ask you, uh, you know, we've covered Fool Us and it's an amazing, if you haven't seen, I'm going to put a link in the description down below. So if you haven't seen it, go and check out Noel's um, uh, performance. It's just brilliant. It's so funny. Um, can I talk to you very quickly before, you know, we're coming close to wrapping this up, but before we do, I'd love to talk to you about digital magic uh, and niching down because that's something that you've done so successfully in the last few years. Yeah. You're one of the few magicians in the UK that are doing digital magic. And I mean proper digital magic. I'm not yeah. talking about, you know, you're pulling a card out of your app on your phone and you're doing yeah. digital force bag. Not that there's anything wrong with those two tricks. They're great. Yeah, I'm not saying yeah. them at all. And I don't want to get, a, you know, a, a hate on this. I think they're both amazing tricks. But what you're doing, you know, somebody can call them. I've seen people call themselves digital magicians with digital force pack and like card from phone whilst you were doing full on scripted original stuff that's just mind blowing and you can do a stage set or a walk around set with with just an ipad and and nothing else seemingly and it's amazing what, what is... so i've, I've like I said, the tech thing i've always been interested in tech whether it's for uh, for methods or effects and presentations and i'll often go to um, a, sort of a, a techie theme for a presentation. So I said, um, you know, uh, any you know, any car trick, and uh, uh, and um, you know, maybe there's there's an app that can help you with that. There's like I said, there's always this romanticised idea that that, uh, that 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 phone and technology could help us in real life. So I've always been interested in that as a presentation, and I I wanted to do it the first year or two of iPads coming out. I thought this could be me. I I, I really fancy doing this. And uh, for whatever reason, I didn't. Um, and I started to, like a lot of people have been doing it for a long time, uh, my passion for doing just general close up dropped. And I thought, I need a gimmick. I need the, the niche thing, it's perfect for me. Uh, Rob James, my friend, um, had started doing sort of pickpocketing, which he'd always loved. And he was excited about the possibilities. Suddenly, his phone's ringing, but not just for come and do magic at Hilton. It was, we'd go, go to Barcelona and do you know, pickpocketing at this huge event or exciting things, things that we're all, you go, oh, wow, I'm kind of interested by that as a, as, as a project. And because of my background in creating original magic um, and the fact that I look nerdy, which again, coming back to how people perceive you, you can be Mr. Slick. You can be the dead-eyed super corporate guy, uh, you know, you're Mr. Apple or Mr. Android and it's and you, you look great. I'm not that guy, but I can certainly play a uh, to the to the, to the geeky thing and the truth is that's closer to what most of the people in that environment will see themselves as they go, oh yeah he's one of ours he's he's a nerdy guy he's a, a techie nerdy guy doing amazing magic tricks but we could see him in the, the server room you know he could be that guy so i uh so i started to build the material there's lots of if you know anyone's trying to get into it which i would discourage them as i would like to be uh, one of the handful of people doing it but it is shit loads of work it is it, so i'll give you this one thing uh if you or i are coming up with a magic trick um and we know that methods aren't particularly important in the early days in fact they have very little consequence just good hook where do you want to go to what's the finish and we work backwards for method it's a fun game we can all do it with a digital thing you need you need to, to know your finish but then you need to think i need uh, uh, uh the, the the visual aspect of it uh, to, to work as well and you can't you can't know what's needed on the digital side until the trick works so you need to get the trick working okay go back to where the digital side is try and marry the two so as uh, if there's animations or there's a, an app that's involved or some kind of other thing and also you've just got one hand often you're holding something 
So you're not, you know, you're not doing your classic pass. You're not, you know, you've you've, you've got something. And you're you one hand is out of commission, but that also helps in other ways. But um, uh, so there's so just coming out with the material, you have to think. I know where I want it to go to. I also know there's just a ton of problems that need to be solved, and often it's jumping between the two of them. So then you need to have either the ability to produce those things yourself, which I don't. I work with a, uh, a couple of great guys who uh, produce the stuff for me. And it goes back and forth. And it, uh, let's say, if you thought of a car trick tomorrow, you could maybe you could put it into a, a set in a, at a week's time. Well, everything for this iPad is six months. It's a uh, minimum to, to get to to, uh, to performance standard. It's uh, it's always a ton and ton of work. Wow, but 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 you know, the, again, the work's paid off for you because you now have this incredibly unique skill. Um, and, and I don't know if I'm right or not, but I'm guessing when close up. Well, I know this for a fact. When close up magic comes back, social distancing is going to be a thing. I imagine a lot of the digital stuff. So it's very important, isn't yeah. an issue because yeah. it's not happening in the hand. It's happening that that's meant to be something coming out of an iPad, by the way, in case you're wondering what yeah. I'm doing. No, no, I, I think I figured it was a, a worried other way. But yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's all those things are, are, are there. It is um, so you can see it from a few feet away. But but you said it a minute ago, and it's absolutely right. Niche, right? Find what you are. Um, you cannot do what well, you could. You could be the journeyman close-up magician. Uh, for, and, and just keep that going for decades. Years and years ago, I was very lucky, and I uh, did a gig with the incredible God of Magic, Pat Page. And there was ten of us, just at one of those Grosvenor houses or somewhere. A ton of us doing magic. And hopefully, everyone's listening knows how brilliant Pat was, an absolute God of Magic. And I was so excited, and I, and I watched him at different tables when I wasn't doing anything and chatted with him. And I went past a, a, a table. And they, and they knew that uh, Pat was on their part, so they knew that they were going to see Pat, but I crossed across. And they said, hey, mate, can you, uh, can you show us a, a trick? I said, don't worry, you in for a treat, guys. Uh, that man there is a god of magic, um, and, uh, and you're going to see miracles. I said, yeah, yeah, well, it's the, it's an old boy. Can you, can you show me a trick? And now, I am not, I'm not fit to lace his, his shoes. Uh, he's a god of magic. But they wanted me, who at the time, when I was you know, 20 years younger, you know, we want, we want the, the fresh face guy. So with close-up magic, getting older isn't a massive problem, but it is an issue. You need to think about it. Um, it is, um, you, you know, if you're getting up there in years and you've not got something, something to offer, so you can be the best one. But if you're the best one, maybe you'll be OK. But if you've got to, you need to have something special. So start thinking now. If you've been doing close-up magic for a while, think, how can I diversify? So whatever, let's say you're interested in sport or, or whatever your extra hobby is apart from magic, everyone's got something. You like football, well, then you can be the football magician. Start building in uh, tricks with balls instead of, uh, footballs instead of sponge balls and bits and pieces, and then market yourself in that way. Because, or if it's golf, it doesn't have to be a sport, but you can be, you can be the guy going around all golf clubs where they say, oh, we, we've got the golf magician tonight, or we've got the, um, you know, the, the fishing magician or whatever whatever your thing is and you don't have to just do those things but think what are you passionate about outside of magic bring that into your own magic and try and diversify try and be it's mad it's your you want to be thinking of magic plus it's no good is just being the, the trick guy uh, because it, you can all find on if you rang me on new year's eve and said i need a magician <clears throat> to start at eight o'clock and it's seven o'clock i could find someone for free to cover the gig um there's just that many magicians you want to be the guy when they say, oh, we had X magician and he was the fire magician. He was the, uh, the some, what's the extra thing? It's magic plus you've got to, uh, you've got to do. So keep your eyes open, whatever you're passionate about and everyone will be interested in something else. And you know what? If it's super niche, all the better. I mean, it comes to the point that it's maybe it's so niche that you can't do anything with it, but magic's a fairly small thing. If you think of, you know, you do an Instagram search for your hobby, I bet you'll see tens of thousands of, 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 uh, of results for that thing and, and images you only need to have uh, enough people to support you that will that are very interested Stuart Lee the brilliant comic has got a, a line where he says I don't need to be you know too rich or too successful I just need 10,000 people who will you know pay me a tenner a year for some of my stuff or I think it's something like it might have been but just you know that's if whatever you do you go okay they're my they're my tribe they're my gang 
So you can be the magician that has that brings uh, windsurfing in, whatever you know, whatever it is, whatever your thing is, you can bring that into your magic or um, you know something like that. Just make some make yourself the most important part of it. And there's no such thing as a bad idea. Uh, you know, don't dismiss it because it sounds stupid. I'm fairly sure that if I describe the concept of Jan Frisch's acts to any magician yeah. and said, why don't you do this and pretend to be neurotic and blah, blah, blah. They would have said- do it with no music and just be, and, and, and there's lots of uh, miming. Yeah, it wouldn't have gone anywhere, would it? No, I would be called crazy, but now look at this guy, you know, it's- yeah. It's just find you and, and like turn that up to, to 11 uh, for, uh, for, for the way you think about your magic. And so people can go, oh yeah, that guy, he was, he was, he was different. So I'm not saying, you don't have to, to to start bringing you know huge props to to, to the gigs that, that you can just just put in the back of your mind because let's say the golf thing right it's what is that like the, the biggest uh, recreational thing in the country you know being the golf magician or, or, or one of those people tons of tricks already work for it uh, and uh, and if you change your brand you just a small tweak all those things you're not changing things massively you're just it's just about positioning and branding Absolutely. It comes back to what you were saying. One thing that I've got from this whole interview, Noel, is you're the guy that if you did, if you decide to do something, you put 150% in and then some. Uh, I, I'm noticing- If I get hooked on it, yeah. Certainly if I get hooked on it, then I will throw myself absolutely crazy into it. It's, it's great to see. It really is. I want to ask you, um, we're almost done now, but can we just touch on virtual magic? Because I know we talked about it off camera. Uh, you have been championing, championing the, the virtual bandwagon right back from the beginning of the pandemic. And we are now getting to a point where the pandemic is, we, we see light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. But I, I know that you're in a similar mindset to me, which is virtual isn't going away. So do you have a message for magicians that haven't maybe even tried to do anything virtually and are just hoping that things go back to normal or, you know, any advice on, on that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I certainly wasn't the, uh, the, the, the first uh, to, um, to get on it, but I was, uh, uh, I was fairly quickly off it uh, to get onto the Zoom um, and the virtual stuff. It's not too late. It's not going anywhere. I mean, it's, hopefully it will, will quiet down. We'll all get back to some level of normality, but it is absolutely sticking around it will be here in three months six months three years it's not going to go away completely uh, also if you've not done it it's not too late you don't have to throw tons of money into it um you can you know if you're a guy on a laptop and um there's friends of mine who are great magicians who've not had any gigs who are who in the past would have done gigs they've done lectures have done bits and pieces and they've stopped completely everyone now um will have I've got the equipment to, to, to do a very simple Zoom show. And if, do you know what, if you, if, even if you think you're terrified of it, just show your, your mates or just show someone, people you see at the pub, just ring them up and say, I'd like to show you a new magic trick I'm working on. Don't pitch it as I'm doing a, you know, a run through of a Zoom show. You're just having a go at it. Because it all seems, all these things seem insurmountable. In the early days, and my girlfriend was the first to say, do, you know, go for this, do this. And I, was like, ah. I kept thinking all of my material is based on putting stuff in people's hands and that that reaction that visceral whoosh moment and I I did and she was it was great advice and I pushed on it and I could see I thought do you know what I can sort of see that this this will work and then you start changing the material and then you go off on that same journey we've talked about before how do you make the tricks your own how do you make something special something interesting but it started slowly and then very quickly I was like okay I can make this work. I can, there's a, I can find a way to do all this material in my own way. So yeah, if it's, it's certainly not too late. <clears throat> Anyone fancies having a go at it, they might think, I remember thinking, well, I remember speaking to someone, maybe like June or July. I said, oh, it's too late to get involved in this, uh, this Zoom stuff, I'm done. And then uh, a few months later, uh, well, it's getting up to Christmas. I mean, I won't have enough time to put together for Christmas. And then, oh, it's just past Christmas. I've got, and the same, they're the same people. Stop putting it off. If you fancy it, it is not done. Yes, there was, you know, a bounty to be had uh, before Christmas, um, but it hasn't gone away completely. And if you start now, no one's coming you, on your advert. You won't say just in full confession, just let you know I wasn't doing Zoom shows until last month. No one gives a shit. Just start now, you know, or, you know, 
do do something so even if you're if you're a, a magic lecturer and you want to do lectures i've been asked a bunch to do magic lectures on zoom i don't i do real in-person lectures but i haven't done a zoom lecture it's all out there also it isn't just magic you could do a talk on uh, josh jay is doing a, a talk on sort of uh, how magicians think there's uh ian keyboard sort of history of magic there's lots of different things uh and the word virtual it's not you're not doing virtual magic it's the only game in town at the moment you're just doing magic if you want to perform a trick unless it's for the people you live with that's the only place you're doing it so stop thinking of it as i don't like virtual magic you're really saying i don't like magic because it's the only game in town you're not going to find another place to perform absolutely Certainly for the next couple of months and you know the other advantage no uh you talked earlier on about the importance of having a good show reel one of the big problems with getting a show reel is getting the footage. You know, hey, can I take Everything my camera, easier. can I take my camera crew to this corporate event and film myself? But on a virtual show, you call up fifteen of your mates and say, hey, can you put on your best clobber and yeah. uh, and watch a half an hour show? I'm going to film it. Do you mind? Then you go and teach yourself Final Cut Pro or uh, iMovie yeah. or something. The next thing you know, you've got a show reel and you haven't had to pay anything for it. Yeah, no, it's uh, joy. It's well, you know, we've been gigging for years. Getting, uh, it used to be you'd go into a gig, you'd, uh, there'd be a, a videographer there, he'd film it, you'd go, oh my God, the place, the venue looks amazing, the bride looks amazing, they're all losing their mind, it's killer stuff, I can't wait, and then you become friends with the, the video guy, and he says, oh, don't worry, I'll give me a business card, give me a call in a week's time, I'll give you that footage. Those, then they just never apply. You ring, you beg, you email, nothing happens. What can you do? You can't break into his house and steal the hard drive. You want that footage, you can't get it. It's never been easier. Like I said, ring a mate, reach not, ring one friend and do a magic trick for them. Um, uh, no one's saying, oh, that only appears to just be one person. Maybe that's the, how the shot's been cropped. It's just one person. Um, you know, in my show reel, I've got a trick that I'm doing for a school friend who I've not seen for 25 years. But she's doing nothing, and you know, said, "Oh yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll watch your, your 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 little trick like like I used to years ago." And uh, and then she um and and, and she's on the on, on the thing, and I just did you know a trick, dressed casually, and it's on my show because she proper loses her mind to to the trick. So it's never been easier to get stuff. You're right. Perfect. That's that's again great advice. We're wrapping it all up now, but I'm going to ask you the same question that I ask everyone that comes on this channel. And uh, that question is very simply, what's next? And, and the reason I tell you this is because you've had an amazing career, Noel. Um, you've been at the top of your game for so long. Uh, you know, you've now appeared on Penn & Teller, full Penn & Teller. You're in a very small niche group that have done that. You've, you know, your creations are well-respected all over the world. You have done, if you decided to give it all up tomorrow, which I know you're not gonna do, your legacy is set. Is there anything left on your magical bucket list? Um, uh, what what are you planning uh, in on doing in the next, you know, decade? Yeah, so so there's uh, if there's not necessarily a, a a massive thing, but I would like to uh, get back to doing uh, stand up uh, techie stuff. Um, I've got a character thing that I do uh, to corporate gigs that I was just starting to really take off. I really want to. Um, massively push that and i've got a um uh, i've got new stuff that i've been sort of softly working on in my mind and i've got i'd say 15 to 20 tricks that, that i would uh, like to push to possibly market and they're all at various different stages as whether i ever actually get to to finish uh, those projects so pick one of those get that finished get back to my stand-up act and uh, work on the character stuff so three, three smaller things. Would you, would you ever write a book? Because I think a book from you would be so interesting. Uh, you, I mean, I know you're very good friends with Andy Gladwin, uh, who, you know, obviously is the man when it comes to publishing books. And, I, you know, the amount of stuff you've done in your career and the amount of stories you could tell and the amount of lessons that you could give, not just from a book of tricks, but also the sort of stuff that we've spoke about on, on, on this interview today. I, I, I would love to see. A book. Well, maybe one day. I, 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 yeah, certainly a few people have mentioned it before, but I've, uh, I think that the, uh, that or a sitcom, I quite, I think sort of two things of, uh, of, uh, I quite fancy doing is there's been, along the way, there's been some fairly crazy things that have happened. So um, 
um, yeah, I, a, a magic book. I'm, I, I need to have enough focus to sit down, but I certainly I think I've got the material and the, uh, and the I can give the advice. Absolutely. Noel, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show Thanks. today. Really, it has. Um, if people want to reach out to you, um, is that okay if they email you or contact you or something? Yeah, if they've, uh, so yeah, noelcalter.com um, and check out the, uh, the YouTube link, which Craig will put for, uh, for full us. Um, also, I'm thinking, I haven't decided yet, but I'm thinking about possibly doing a download to explain the, the full loss trick. So um, if, uh, if I do, then uh, I uh, then I imagine Craig will let you all know uh, about the link. But uh, yeah, so stay tuned. That might, that, that might be happening. And also, if you want to get what I think is the absolute best build to Sharpie routine, it does have its own dedicated website. It is still available. And what was that one more time? It was thismagictrick.com. Guys, you really need to get it. It's the best build in Sharpie there is. Noel, one more time, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, and thank you for everything that you do and you continue to do for magic. Thanks, Ray. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And guys, uh, leave a comment down below. I'm sure that Noel will see them. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, please like the video. Subscribe to the channel. I'm going to be back again tomorrow with another video. I'll see you then. Take care. Bye, everybody. Yeah.